two things before we get started. Uh, profanity is the jazz of the Irish, and I get excited, and I drop F-bombs every once in a while. It's just, I love what I do, and I get jacked up by it, so please, I don't mean to be offensive or rude, it's just part of the gig. Secondly, I'm a white dude in America, and it can be very easy sometimes for men like me to get up and start talking all about what they've done without acknowledging that doors flew open. So I'm always intrigued, man, sometimes some D for dub bullshit gets all dressed up as brilliant when a white dude utters it. And the reality is, I'm going to talk about some cool stuff, but I go to acknowledge right off the bat that a lot of what brought me here today was right time, right place, and a huge dollop of confidence. Um, but I started running nightclubs when I was a young man. That was my chosen profession. I grew up here in San Diego in the 1960s. My pop was in the service, and we moved all over the place. But this part of my life here in San Diego, and then ultimately up in the tragic kingdom, Anaheim, California, really were influential because it was in that period between 1967 and 1969, which for a young boy coming of age was profound because so many of the things that society had put into very convenient boxes that kept people of my gender and complexion happy were being revealed as real misused assets in America. Women, people of color, migrant farm workers. So as a young man coming of age, I was very aware of this crazy time in our country in which every social norm was being challenged. And I became very impressed and very much um, in the summer of 1968, uh, first in April, for those of you who will remember, Dr. King was murdered in April in Memphis, and then two months later in Los Angeles, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. And that was, these were profound moments. And I really pretty much self-baptized in this idea of I want to be part of this social change agenda. Now, as a young man, I really keyed into the power of music and theater and comedy and dance. And at a very early age, much to my Marine Corps father's chagrin, I decided I wanted to open the greatest nightclub in the world. And I pursued that with a young man's fervor because I believe that music, and this is important, brothers and sisters, to realize that most people in America are genuinely nice people. They give $300 billion a year to charity to do good works. They do all kinds of good things, but they're afraid. And sometimes you have to trick them into seeing things they don't want to hear or talk about. So I became fascinated by the power of Motown, for example, in my youth, to get many parents who would, were really scared of some of the social issues to hear ideas because it was disguised as music. So that was my original intent. But then I ended up going out one night to serve the homeless in Washington, D.C., where my folks had moved and where I lived for almost 40 years. And I ended up um, in the warmth of a truck serving people who were in line outside in the rain. I was up in the warm truck, and here was a line of people down the street, right by George Washington University and the State Department, outside in the rain, waiting for this truck, which showed up dutifully night after night with a new group of volunteers, all excited by this historic, traditional response. But that response, I've said this many times, was based more on the redemption of the giver, not the liberation of the receiver. And that flaw of charity, this amazing part of the American economy, this American part of who we are as a people, this thing that is shared by every faith tradition, to me, this is its great flaw, this sense of, and I became fascinated on this idea of what happens if we offered men and women a chance to come in out of the rain and be part of the solution, to kind of break this construct that men on the street are only eligible for charity when they have just as many opportunities. In fact, a big part of what I want to pitch today in my very short period of time is one really big overarching idea. Nonprofits, no matter how good you are, we can't fix anything. It's beyond us. We can't, but we can lead society to greater truths like the power of community when we work side by side. So what I wanted to do was create a cooking school where you could take food that was thrown away in our society. And back then, this was somewhat of a new idea, but we know now that we throw away an estimated 40% of the food we produce every single day in America, half of it cosmetically imperfect fruits and vegetables. But the idea of if you could get that food and bring it to a central hub kitchen, not only could you feed more people better food for less money, but if you offered men and women, again, a chance to come in out of the rain and be part of the solution, you could actually shorten the line by the way you serve the line. And you could actually show Washingtonians the power of working side by side. And that included, over many different years, presidents and first families, including the Obamas and the Clintons, that would come down and imagine the power, not just for our own organization, but through the media that would follow the presidents, when they would see a president of the United States standing to some, next to somebody who might have been in prison for 20 years or next to some kid in high school who just had to get some service hours, or next to an older person who was retired but wanted to stay active, or somebody who'd come out of a drug treatment program 
Regardless of which, imagine that power of seeing the president as an equal, not as someone serving Thanksgiving dinner, but as an equal citizen standing next to someone working side by side to make their community better and even more powerful. Imagine that moment when it happened many times when the president would look over to the person next to him and say, am I doing this right? And the power of somebody and the strange, joyful paradox of life when somebody who might have spent 20, 25, 30 years away in this magic moment could turn and say, no, it's not right, you do it this way. That's the power of food and existing resources. Now I'm gonna fast forward because after 25 years in Washington, I came back to the community that gave me so much, somewhat like a prodigal child returned after 40 years in the Washington wilderness with an idea. But it was based on two profound things that are very germane to our universal world. Supply and demand. In my world, and I assume all of you who have been to a pantry or a food bank in your life, but let's get this down to some serious hardcore stuff. Every single morsel of food and every single food bank and every single pantry represents one overarching thing, lost profit. You know, we're coming out of an era where the American post-World War II economy, which would created a once in a thousand year surplus that allowed nonprofits to grow from 65,000 to 1.4 million over the last 30 years. We got all the extra food, all the extra time, all the extra money, and mind the way, not front money, extra money, the leftover money. We got leftover buildings, leftover time, that's all constricting, and that's gonna put a tremendous strain, but in one of the most profound areas will be the way we have historically fed the poor, whether it's SNAP benefits, which are gonna come under fire this year predictably, or whether it's the steady decrease in the amount of food that's donated to charity. But the second big issue that fascinated me was this issue of aging in America. This is probably gonna be one of those profound issues globally, and believe me, there is no plan whatsoever there's not a city to my knowledge, and someone please correct me if I'm wrong once I get off stage, but please, <laughs> the reality is there's very few cities that have a plan. In fact, with all due respect, in most cities you go to, the Department of Aging is the last island on the archipelago of city government. It's almost like Lord of the Flies, man. Nobody cares what goes on out there. You know, and the reality is this should be the place, this should be mayors demanding innovation because one of the most pressing issues in our country is not so much senior poverty, but it's keeping seniors living independently and staying productively, productive as long as humanly possible. And productivity equals volunteerism. Every single mayor in America should be calling double secret meetings of all their nonprofits saying we must, not only socially, but this generation represents the deepest well of life experience in the history of the world. Shame on us if we don't take full and every opportunity of this generation, pull them back out. For many of them, it might be hard, particularly for you younger people who oftentimes, I'm sure, wish there was almost a rapture for boomers. Suddenly you just woke up and there was a bunch of boomer clothes laying around America and we were gone overnight. Short of an asteroid hitting the earth, that is not gonna happen. So we must create intergenerational alliances. But let's go back to the reason I've been asked here is to talk about these eyes wide shut assets that exist in every single community. I have been, my entire career has been built around this idea of, I take the things that our society views as part of the problem and reveals that they can be part of the solution. So in LA, I came back here to open the LA Kitchen about four years ago, and the idea was, I wanted to take leftover food, young people aging out of foster care, older men and women returning home from decades in incarceration, and elders. Four of the most profound issues that are perceived in most places as these are bad things. These are loaded with really ridiculously bad statistics. So most people approach it, statistic, I mean, whether it's nonprofits, whether it's donors, whether it's mayors, governors, or even presidents, view these as negatives. And I think that's the problem, is we put people in this box of no value or spent lives versus that idea of everyone has a role, everyone has a gift. As I've said before, a great nonprofit doesn't try and fix the problem, it reveals larger truths to the way they do their daily business. And in our situation, it's saying, look, imagine the power of an older person coming after 10, 20, 30 years away and having not only a place that welcomes them into a job training program, but actually offers them a chance to not only learn a skill, but to mentor a young person so they don't fall into the same trap they did. Because we know statistically young men and women aging out of foster care, oh, while I am loath to paint with a big brush, nonetheless have a tough journey ahead of them. So again, that idea of could somebody stay out of prison through the very act of mentoring a younger person, and conversely, can a young person help an older person acclimate to a world that is sped up so very fast? 
we have a very simple model. We, in effect, have two sides, a nonprofit side in which farmers donate food that cannot be sold. Again, cosmetically imperfect fruits and vegetables first and foremost, mainly because this, is, this part of the country represents almost the biggest pharmacy in the history of the world as far as beautiful, fresh, wholesome product. And again, I want to give props to the next panel. One of my favorite people, Michelle Nishan from Wholesome Wave, is going to be speaking and taking what I'm talking now to a whole other level. But that idea of being able to access that kind of product to train younger men and women home from prison, uh, out of foster care, older men and women home from prison, while they're learning, they're teaching other people. Again, younger people. LA has 750,000 kids who have to get service hours. And again, don't you love how we make service hours? It's something you need to do to be a better person, but if you don't show up on time, we're gonna punish you and give you more service hours. What a weird message we send, but that idea of saying, oh my God, and in fact, you wanna talk about an eyes wide shut asset? Probably one of the greatest social experiments in the history of the world, bar none. Right now in America, the millennial generation, 100 million strong, the most diverse generation in the country of America, the most technologically advanced, um, almost 100% have been raised doing some form of service. What an amazing experiment. Yet no one's really stopped and thought, what does that mean? What kind of asset is that for a young mayor of a town, not so much like San Francisco, or San Diego, or Los Angeles, but Stockton, Fresno, Bakersfield. By the way, check out the mayor of Stockton if we haven't talked about him. Remember, that young brother is terrorizing shit right now. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, seriously, but that's what's, that's what's powerful. Because mayors all across America, their number one thing is how do I keep the money local? And a lot of what we're talking about is things that really normally they perceive as this is going to cost us a lot of money to deal with these issues. And what we're trying to say is, no, that's a really ridiculously outdated way to think. And we need to start thinking that way ourselves first and then convert the elected leaders to see not only the people we serve, but us as assets in the community. Man, I'm on, a, I'm on fire now. The F-bombs are going to come. You all better buckle up your seatbelts, man, because I'm coming now. But let's get back. I don't want to step track from the, D, from the LA kitchen because again, while those men and women are learning themselves, they're guiding and teaching older men and women who volunteer, younger men and women, and together they're producing beautiful, healthy, plant-forward meals that are actually also eyes wide shut, helped to develop by a generation of young people in every single university who want de deliberate internships. Our, six, our system our, at LA Kitchen is full of a younger generation. We do culinary medicine for second year med students who are desperate to learn preventative care versus giving people pills. You've got an army, whether they're occupational therapists, nutritionists, social workers, dance majors who want to get credit hours but want to do it with a partnership with nonprofits in a way that terrorize normal and do something bold. There's a generation that's itching, itching for a chance to do something really different, and they're waiting for an invitation from one and all of you all to say, come to our town. Anything we do in our nonprofit is open to reinterpretation by a younger generation's vision. In fact, I tell you, that's, I'm, I'm jumping around, I apologize in advance, but you gotta really open up your door to a generation of younger leaders who can help you reinterpret your metrics. I came up in a world with nonprofits where the metric for success was pounds moved, agency served, which in my opinion dragged us in the wrong direction. We should have been measuring how fewer people needed food at the end of each year, not how many more people we signed up. But more importantly, we also run a social business. And I came here to really focus on this issue of how can we turn meals on wheels or the provision of meals to our elders and an opportunity to support local, um, local um, farms. So for example, we're doing a partnership now where we're actually gonna be paying young kids in local school gardens, to, we'll buy the food they grow, which means not only can we support that farming program, but we can also start to introduce um, entrepreneurship in school. Because the future, and in fact, you know, I don't know how many of you all watch this, and maybe you all, some, some of you all came from towns in which people were climbing all each, over each other to get Amazon to come to their town, which was a fool's errand. But the reality is, I'll tell you, the last great asset I wanna talk about, because my time's short here, is the nonprofit sector ourselves. How many of you all work in a nonprofit organization? Dudes, you know, we're the third biggest employers in America. We represent 300 billion in annual revenue. We have 14 trillion in assets, 14 million employees, and 70 million annual volunteers. But when was the last time you heard your mayor talk about the nonprofit sector as an ally to create more jobs in America? You know, this is kind of what I'm talking about. If you follow the very weird line I've drawn today, food that was thrown away, felons who come home who are most likely just gonna uh, go back to prison, younger men and women who are statistically gonna end up on the street, older people and nonprofits themselves. What I've been pitching, brothers and sisters, are the hidden assets, the gold at our feet, 
that is waiting for a new generation of entrepreneurs to come along, not only to build your own pro programs to do better, bolder, badder work, but more importantly, for a generation of mayors who show up on day one saying, social enterprise, man, bring it to me. And in fact, what they should be saying is to every single university that has a social enterprise program or a nonprofit management program, if you can tell this administration how you're gonna create more jobs, keep people out of prison, keep people off the street, get better food to schools, get better food to seniors, create a more just city, a more economically profound city, and a city where everybody has a place and a role, man, I will pay you to stay in this town and I will help you open your business. Most mayors approach the, 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 the economy with a bifurcated lens. Dot com businesses drive the economy while dot org businesses do good deeds. And the reality is you can't make profit without nonprofits. You know, think about it. What town can thrive without arts and culture, communities of faith, healthcare, education, clean air, clean water. We are equal to business, and you can make a case that we're even more important than business for the vitality of every single city in America. But what we need to do is elect a generation of mayors who don't look at us as lesser than, and don't let us necessarily look at it just as equals, but the most fiery, entrepreneurial, excited, focused, true-blooded Americans there are, people who believe so firmly, so firmly in the power of equality the power of equal opportunity, the power of community, that they would give up the career and the lucrative nature of so many other businesses to pursue, pursue their heart's dream, to run a business that does nothing more than make their community whole. That's us, that's our power. I urge you all to own it. I urge you to go home and be political, help elect a generation of mayors, try and run for office yourself, but for heaven's sakes, don't accept the world as it exists. It's every generation's right to channel the assumptions of the previous generation. Be respectful, but be impatient. Demand new things. Go out and prove they, they, they can work through your own actions. But again, help the larger society see that oftentimes what they're afraid of the most is the thing they should be grabbing closest to hold on to. Thank you all very, very much.